Um, when we look into Revelation 15, we are also going to mix it up with Exodus uh, from chapter 7 all the way to chapter 12 as well. Um, so there will be a strong relationship between the two. I'm mentioning that so that when I start explaining, you will be able to know where I am making the connections from. They will be coming from Exodus 7 um, to Exodus uh, 12 and 13 um, as well. That is where the connections will be coming from. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word is holy and true. It is a guide for all humanity in this world. There is none among us who knows the way to you except through your son Jesus Christ and through the revelation of your will in the scriptures and through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Even now, Heavenly Father, we therefore ask, now as we have read your word, glorify your son Jesus Christ in our lives through whom and only whom we can be saved. Glorify the works of your salvation in our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit and cement the power of your word in our lives so that when we have read it, we may not deviate from your word, but must always take instruction from it. And as your word instructs us that we should neither move to the left nor to the right, but stay firmly on the path that is set out by your instructions for us. We pray all this through Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. Revelation 15 is an interlude, okay? And that means we are taking some kind of a break from uh, the major sins that have happened and the major sins that are about to happen, okay? We've just come from a very dramatic uh, series, if one may put it that way, um, of, of, of the trumpets and we've seen what has been happening um, we, we've been and we still are um, under the seventh the trumpet which was the last a uh, trumpet that was blown um, in particular we've gone through Revelation 13 and 14 which were very dramatic with very big um, scenes on them, okay? Um, there were beasts and 144,000. There were issues of worship. So there was quite a lot um, that was happening then. Now, Revelation 4, 15 sort of tempers down a bit because it, it, it's, it's bridging these two, but in terms of the, the, the drama and the activity, it's not that much there because it is bridging for the next scene. It's like almost a comma, okay, in the whole a, 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 a drama and the events. So a, a Revelation 15 becomes a breather, a pause, because we are heading to Revelation 16 and 17, where we are going to again engage with great uh, and, and dramatic scenes that are going to follow where we are dealing with the plagues. We are also dealing with the, the woman that is Babylon and, um, and, 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 and the likes. So we are taking a break before another great, cosmic um, upheaval, if one may call it that, that is uh, then going to follow um, afterwards, okay? Now, John says he then sees this vision in heaven after he had seen the 144,000, after he had seen the confirmation of the three um, angels' message, as well as the reaping of the earth, okay, that we saw yesterday with the sickles. Now he sees in this vision, he sees two, seven um, angels, okay? And these seven angels are now coming out of the, of, of, of the tabernacle, okay? And also the language is a bit interesting because up until now, um, the, the sanctuary in heaven has simply either been called a sanctuary or a tabernacle uh, 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 by John. But now he uses... Um, interesting language in that he calls it uh, the tabernacle of the testimony, okay? And, and that's a bit of a mix of language because um, where we've seen this uh, phrase of uh, 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 the tabernacle of the testimony in the Old Testament, it usually refer referred to the ark 
of the covenant. The ark of the covenant was sometimes called the ark of the testimony. So you would have the sanctuary in which there was this ark of the testimony. Okay. Uh, and, and, and now John mixes it. He says, these angels, these seven angels come out from the tabernacle um, of the te uh, testimony or the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony, okay? And the language there could be eluding uh, to a symbolism of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, remember the, uh, the reason why the Ark of the Covenant was referred to as the Ark of the Testimony. Um, in, in, our, in our modern day use of the language, particularly as we are using English, we use a testimony uh, as, as to mean a, a witness, all right, that you may give or somebody else may give um, on anything. Like if there's a court case, you come and you testify. So you become a witness. You give a witness to a particular uh, aspect of the court case. For them, the word testimony also implied an agreement to a covenant, okay? So, hence, for example, the, the, the Ten Commandments were, were sometimes called the Ark of the Testimony because it meant that it was an Ark of the Agreement. It was an ark of an agreement between God and humanity. In other words, the ark carries an agreement between God and man, okay? And, 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 and as a result, then, if the, the Israelites were not keeping the law of God, then they were testifying falsely, okay? They were testifying falsely against uh, 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 the, the agreement that they had made with God. And that is why you will see in the Old Testament, whenever God, for example, was, was disappointed with Israel, he would raise this issue that you have broken my covenant, you have broken my statutes. Okay, why would he say that? Because in Exodus chapter 19, when he came on Mount Sinai to give them the Ten Commandments, they themselves said, everything that the Lord asks, we will do. Also, when the meeting between a, a, a Moses and, and, and um, God was concluded, remember that when he came down the first time, he found them worshipping uh, that golden calf, and he broke the Ten Commandments. However, he did go back to the mountain and God gave him another set of tablets. And when he then delivered the second group, the Israelites responded again and said, whatever the Lord asks, we confirm that we will do. That is why it is called the Ark of the Testimony, because they agreed to it. It is not something that God forced them to agree to. In fact, in, 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 in their journey from Egypt to Canaan land, we know that quite a number of times God gave them the option to walk away from the covenant because they were behaving like people who didn't want to be in the covenant, okay? And God would say to them, if it pleases you to go back to Egypt, if it pleases you to go back to your, to your, to your masters, then let it be, okay? And of course, uh, I think once or twice, he actually threatened that he would destroy them in the wilderness. But generally, he would say to them, look, if really what I am asking you to do is a burden to you that you cannot bear, then it is better that we, we, we separate and you go back um, in, in, into uh, Egypt or you stay and die in the wilderness and I will raise another nation for myself that will honor this covenant. And Israel would time and time again respond by saying, no, no, we, we, we understand uh, and we confirm that whatever you ask, we will do. So it becomes the arc of the testimony because more than once, more than twice, more than three, four, five, or six times, they would approach God and say, we agree. 
we agree that we are going to do um, these things. Now, once you agree, obviously, then there is accountability that needs to take place because we agree on what needs to happen. And, and, and that is why it was called the Ark of the Testimony. And that's where I, I, I just want to start uh, briefly this evening before I, I move into the other issues. I think it's important for all of us to remember that even as we read the book of Revelation, which is about uh, the second coming of Jesus and the end to sin, I also do want us to appreciate the fact that God how do I phrase this properly? Our relationship with God has always been governed by choice. At the center of the government of God is choice, even to the detriment of our understanding of God. Still, he has not taken away choice. For example, you'll find that many people will ask the question, um, why? Why, why is sin around? Why didn't God destroy the devil? Why didn't God just destroy Adam and Eve and create a new thing? If God, you know, all of these questions, if God knows the future, why did he allow sin to happen? If God knew we were going to suffer like this, why did he allow things to happen? And yet that has always been one of the things that the Bible is trying to emphasize, that God has always been a God who governs by choice. And that when Adam and Eve made that choice, God was not going to stand against that choice. As much as the choice was destructive, yet it is in his character and it is in the nature of his governance to always make sure that when he governs, as much as he has the power to dictate, he prefers to be chosen. He prefers to be wanted. Not that he doesn't have power to make us want him or to even make us love him without even knowing that there's any other option other than him. So God was well within his power to make sure that we never know what sin looks like or we never know what the devil may look like. And, and yes, we would have lived in eternal happiness. However, what that would have meant is that the choice that is at the center of God's governance would not have been exercised by us. So yes, unfortunately, we, we, we may raise many you know, questions about why was this permitted. At the center of it is choice. At the center of it is choice. And those of us who are parents will understand this. You know, uh, at least within the first um, 18, 19, sometimes even 20 years of your child's life, um, your word is law. Your word is life, okay? Um, you know, give or take some uh, 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 differences here or there in the challenges we may face in our families. But no matter how much you may, you may have educated your child, no matter how much you may have wanted your child to make the most perfect and right choices, ultimately, um, at some point, your child is not yours to control. They are their own person, okay? And, and when they go out to govern themselves, you can only hope that the good you've taught them Will, will influence how they choose to govern themselves. And it's the same with God as well. At the center of God's governance, it has always been this idea that people must choose righteousness. It shouldn't be that righteousness is the only thing made available, but that they should know that righteousness will always be the best choice that should be chosen. But of course, when, when, when Lucifer chose or when Lucifer designed or when Lucifer created sin, he created an alternative which God was not going to shy us away from. It is not God's alternative. It is not God's desired alternative, but it was an alternative whose reality, though he was able to stop and destroy, he opted that not only humanity, remember choice, didn't begin with us. Choice began first with God himself when he decided, I know that sin is coming, but I will not stop it or prevent it. It will happen. 
choice also was given to angels when God decided, I will allow this sin to start and for my angels to make a choice. Then thirdly, choice was given to us when God said, you know what, let it go on earth. If he wants to go on earth, let him go, let him tempt them. And in all this, the plan of salvation was always there. But choice has always been um, at the center. Now, why am I mentioning this issue of choice or this issue of the covenant of, of the testimony? I do think that sometimes, sometimes we, we have a misrepresentation of God in our faith where we act as though, um, you know, how, how do I put it? We act as though God is some dictator that we don't have an option away from. No, we do have an option away. We, we really do. We have an option away. And let me tell you this as well. When you decide that you don't want God, God is not going to destroy you. Let me uh, explain what I mean. You see, the destruction of sin and hell, they will not happen because God wants them to happen. They will happen because it is in the nature of sin to destroy itself and its followers. And it is in the nature of God to bring eternal life to his followers. For God is eternal life, and so those who follow him will find eternal life. Now, since sin has a date when it began, it surely has a date when it will end. So when you choose sin, it's not God that is going to orchestrate the destruction of sinners. Sin itself, by its own nature, will be destroyed because it is a finite thing. It cannot be immortal. Only God is immortal. It cannot be eternal. Only God is eternal. And only those things which God invites into himself also carry immortality. And he has not invited sin into himself. And so at some point, sin will bring itself through the power of God to an end. And so for that reason, I'm saying it's like as a parent, if I am saying to my child, listen to me, this life of yours of not taking school seriously will land you in trouble one day. Now, when your child is poor one day because they didn't study, it's not you who's punishing them. It is the natural consequence of laziness. However, you happened to have proclaimed it in advance. Proclaiming it doesn't mean you designed it. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Proclaiming the future of a lazy person does not mean you've designed their future. It simply means you know where this is going because laziness has never produced any other result. So we all know where it will end. And sin is the same. Sin is the same. No matter how people may look and think, eh, 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 you know, God is, is, is dictating their lives, is taking away their choices. At the end of the day, eternal life is only found in God, for he alone is eternal. And the eternal ending of things is found in sin. For sin alone has an ending that will never be reversed. And so one ought to choose what is your testimony with God? Is it to follow him or is it to follow other things? And of course, whichever we choose to follow, then there are consequences that uh, will follow that. Then the seven angels, when they come out of the temple, the, 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 the Bible then says one of the four living creatures uh, around the throne then gives each of them a bowls. And in these bowls is um, wrath. God's wrath, as, 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 as the Bible puts it. Now, this, of course, is a climax of God's punishment to a sinful world. And it makes sense because in Revelation chapter 14, we now know of the 144,000. We now know of the numberless crowd of those who are going to be saved. For that reason, God is not worried anymore about the saints because they are future 
their eternity is now sealed and set aside. This is now about the punishments that are going into the world, which has chosen um, a, 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 the mark of the beast. And we know that because when we read right there in, 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 in Revelation 15, it does say exactly there that the, the, those who have conquered those who have overcome and were able to uh, overcome the beast, were able to overcome the mark of the beast and to triumph over the number um, of the name, that is triple six. They are the ones who are now together um, with the lamb, okay? And as you saw the song that is there, that they are now singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So these bones that are filled with the wrath of God, they are no they have nothing to do with God's children. And and I have said this before, I have said it so many times, I will say it again. If anything in the book of Revelation threatens your life then you should worry about whose side you are on because the book of revelation is about god's response to the powers of darkness in the book of revelation it is not the saints that suffer but it is those who have chosen evil so if there be any prophecy here that threatens you and makes you feel uncomfortable, one may need to then introspect whose side are you on? Because in the book of Revelation, though our suffering is mentioned, yet the targets of God's anger here are not his own children, but it is those who have chosen uh, 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 the way of the beast, and the mark of the beast as well. So they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Now, in, 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 in the context of the Hebrews, there has always been an association, and here's quite something interesting. When the Israelites left Egypt and they crossed the, the Red Sea, when they got to the other side, Miriam then sang a song that she composed a song of praise and worship for liberation and deliverance. And of course, the Exodus is always associated with Moses. And so the, over the years, they developed this position that the truest experience of liberty, the truest experience of freedom shall be symbolized with singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Why? Because Moses is the father of freedom. Moses is the symbol of freedom for those who are oppressed on earth, okay? And, and, and as, as a leader of the Exodus, okay? But it is the song of Moses and the Lamb because ultimately it is a song that celebrates the liberation that is found in Jesus Christ. Now, up to today, up to today, no one knows what the song of Moses and the Lamb is or what it sounds like. In different parts of scripture, like in Revelation, uh, as you see there in, in verse 3 and 4, you may find some of the lyrics, but no one knows exactly what this song sounds like. But I have a suspicion. I have a suspicion that those of us who are going to make it to heaven, somehow, when this song is started, all of us will know what it says and we will know what it means and we will know how to join it and we will know what words should follow. I, I, I doubt anyone will need to be given a hymn book or a hymnal. I think that the song itself will resonate with everyone who was saved from the darkness of sin in this world through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at the cross. So it should be something that you and I look forward to, to be present in singing a song that we never rehearsed. But somehow we will know the names, we are the words, we will know the, the lyrics, we will know the music, we will know the melody, we will know everything about this song. You know, uh, one, one of the... It, whenever I, I, I read 
this a, a portion about the song of Moses and the Lamb, I'm always reminded by this song uh, sung by the 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 Gaitha vocal uh, band. There's a song that they sing that says, uh, "Let freedom ring." You know, deep within the heart has always known that there is freedom. Um, and and I always think of that song that you know. I think one day when Christ is finished with this work and we make it to heaven, uh, we will know because the heart had always been longing for true freedom and liberty. We will know how to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb because finally we will have received the freedom and the liberty that we had always been waiting for. Now they are given bowls, bowls that have plagues and these plagues are going to be poured onto the earth. Now this reminds us of Exodus chapter uh, 7 going all the way to 13 because we have seen this before when God pours out plagues onto a, 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 a people that oppose him. And we saw that in Egypt, when God poured out the plagues that were uh, uh, poured out to, to the Egyptians. But I want to just touch on something firstly, before we get into them. One, you will see that there's a parallel. In the book of Exodus, God poured out the plagues after the Pharaoh, did a, 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 a two very important things. One, after the Pharaoh questioned the godliness of God. Do you remember what the Pharaoh said to, 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 to Moses and Aaron in Exodus chapter 5? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Who is this Lord that you, you are talking to me about that I, I, Pharaoh, okay? Maybe you need to understand the background as well. The word Pharaoh, uh, in, in, in their language, in their ancient language, it literally meant the God man. The God man. That is what Pharaoh means, the God man. So in their religions, Pharaohs were gods as well. So when, 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 when God sent Moses, Pharaoh is then saying, I am a God in my own right. I am a God in my own right. Why would then I allow myself, another God, to give me instructions? Who is this Lord? I am an Egyptian God. I know my brothers and sisters who are the gods and goddesses of Egypt. Who is this God of yours? I don't know him. All right. And, and so that is the first thing that Pharaoh did. Pharaoh questioned the God's a, 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 a position as a God, whether... He even deserves to be acknowledged. And then secondly, of course, Pharaoh questioned the right of God to deliver the Israelites. Okay? Pharaoh asks, where is he taking you? Because you are busy here. We've given you work to do. Have we not given you enough work? Have we made a mistake by bringing you the straw? Maybe we should not give you the straw at all. You should find your own straw and also create the, the concrete for the blocks and everything that you, um, you need. So he questions whether even God has the power to deliver, let alone what does God know about having people? What is he going to be doing with them? You will notice that this is parallel to Revelation 13 because, excuse me, Revelation 13 is about the same. In Revelation 13, the beast questions whether God truly deserves to be worshipped. And number two, as we saw in Revelation 13, the beast believes that people belong to him, not to God. That is why he puts his mark on them because he doesn't understand why does God want people? What will God do with people? I deserve the worship and these people should be mine. And so when God responds to the beast, when God responds to the devil in Revelation 15 as he begins his response, he, he takes us back to Exodus uh, uh, chapter 5 all the way to 13 to say, I, we've been here before where a false God questioned my godliness and a false God questioned my authority 
over the universe which I have created and my people who are in it. And it is as if God is saying, I will deal with you, Lucifer, the same way I dealt with you in Egypt. But this time, you will not be represented by Pharaoh and I am represented by Moses. This time, I will be addressing you and all your followers, uh, anyone who has chosen you, just as for Pharaoh chose you and hardened his heart and preferred to listen to you rather than to me. For that reason, I will do the same now as I did then. Just as I humbled Pharaoh with the plagues that I poured out then, I will also humble the earth even now and all those who have opted to follow you through um, the plagues that I am going to be pouring out. Okay, so just see those parallelisms um, that are there. Now, when you go to the book of Exodus, uh, just to do a quick reminder, the first, the first plague was a plague um, that turned the water into blood. Then we had the second plague, um, which uh, brought in the frogs. The third plague was the plague of the lice. And then the fourth plague was the plague um, of the flies. And then we had the plague uh, of the livestock that got diseased. Number six was the boils on their skin. Number seven was the hail that fell down and destroyed homes and uh, uh, killed livestock. And then the eighth one was the locusts. And uh, all right. And then we go to the ninth one, which was darkness. And of course, then the last one was the number 10, the death of the firstborns. Okay. And, and that is how ultimately the Egyptian empire was collapsed. Uh, uh, in, in, in its slavery uh, through those 10 plagues. Now, the same thing is happening, but now God is preparing seven plagues, okay, which he is going to dish out. Now, also, let me remind you of something very important that I think we must be able to notice and connect with the Revelation 15. In the book of Exodus, with all these 10 plagues, at no point were the Israelites harmed. On plague number 10, God asked the Israelites to put blood on their doors. But their protection didn't begin that night. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not like they, the plagues that came before also affected them. And then when God, uh, on, on plague number 10, then God says, okay, now you put on the blood. And when you put on the blood, then nothing is going to happen to you. From plague number one, they were always protected even before they put on the blood. And when they did put on the blood, then the angel passed over as we know. And, and this again carries the theme of revelation that Whichever punishment that God is about to release, let's be aware at no point are his children in danger. Because it is parallel to what is happening in Egypt. Just like in Egypt, there was no plague that endangered the Israelites even before they even put the blood on the door, the mercy and the grace of God was already protecting them. The same thing is being shown here, that the same thing is going to happen with the plagues that are going to follow. Those who are in Christ have no reason to worry or to be threatened by what is about to happen because there is consistency in the way that God has always dealt with plagues and punishment for, for, for sinful opposition, his children have always been safe. And of course, there are some differences in, in, in Exodus. We have 10 plagues here, we have got uh, seven plagues. And within the context of a revelation where everything is symbolic, so we know that uh, the seven plagues may simply represent the perfect final punishment of God, okay? What is a perfected punishment into the world as uh, we are heading to Revelation 22 where God is concluding, where God is concluding um, 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 all that work. So 
it would be good to study the plagues of the book of Exodus as we prepare for uh, reading um, Revelation chapter 16 tomorrow. Uh, because when the, those uh, plagues are poured out uh, that are there in Revelation 16, I am then going to be traveling back, looking at the plagues of Exodus in detail. And you are going to see where they are similar, where they differ, and what then could they mean? What could they represent? And also we will need, be needed to ask the question, have they started? Because I think that's the big question that most of us are interested in. Have these plagues actually started? If they have, which one are we on? If they haven't, can we at least get a clue that uh, where are we now in terms of these plagues that are announced there? And again, keep in mind, our uh, wanting to understand the plagues is not because we are threatened. It's not because we need to make preparations before we, we are caught off guard. Of course, if you are not in Christ, you will need to make those preparations before you are caught off guard. But if you are in Christ, then again, as we have repeatedly said, this is not about you. This doesn't threaten you. This doesn't concern you in the negative sense, except only to just look at the world and know that redemption draweth nigh. That is the only reason why we would want to keep track um, of these plagues and also um, what these plagues mean. The last aspect that I'd like to speak about in terms of Revelation 15 and the plagues, it is this. Plagues by their nature are all-encompassing. As we would see in the book of Exodus and we would see in the Old Testament and even here in, in, in Revelation chapter 15, plagues may attack nature itself plagues may attack a, a, a human beings and so they may be well diversified and so one of the things that we need to look forward to when we are studying revelation 15 is not to just look at what affects human beings but it is also to look at what is affecting the planet that we are in i mean we are talking about global warming currently are we really talking about global warming could we be in one of these plagues uh, as we speak? And if yes, how is it revealing itself through this global warming? And if not, then what can we learn also um, uh, 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 from, from what is currently happening um, in the world that we are in? So, Revelation 15, a prelude. We are about to get into the punishments. Should that concern you and me? Absolutely not because we are in the 144,000, we are in Revelation 14. So what is about to happen, we simply need to know it as part of marking the times, the signs of the times, not necessarily that we need to prepare for it because it is going to threaten us. Like the Israelites in Egypt, every plague was directed to those who have been disobedient. For that reason, even at this point in time, these plagues do not endanger anyone in God's family. So basically, like I said, Revelation 15 is very short, more of an introduction um, into uh, the, the seven bowls um, that we are going to be looking into. And as a takeaway this evening, it is just for us um, to be reminded that we, we have a relationship with God, an agreement with him. We have an ark of the testimony in our hearts through Christ Jesus. And I, I, I would like to challenge us um, to, from time to time, rem remember, revive, and recommit ourselves to God. You know, when we conduct weddings, uh, sometimes we will just ask couples who are there in a wedding who have been married for, 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 for years um, to just stand up with their spouses and uh, uh, join the, the newlyweds in doing their vows. You know, um, I've, I've done it. I've seen also other pastors do it where in a wedding you will ask couples, please stand up and uh, hold each other's hands and you say, uh, you know, you make them do the vows together with the new couple, just to remind everyone 
uh, why we came into this. I think that our faith and our relationship with God is the same. Some of us, we've been baptized 20 years, 30 years, 35, 40 years, um, you know, 10 years. And now and then we get so caught up in the things of this world that sometimes our relationship and our covenant and our testimony with Jesus is eclipsed by so many things that we are dealing with. And so from time to time, it's good to remind yourself of the agreements that exist between you and Jesus and the, uh, the love and agreement that God made towards you and you made um, towards him. So this evening, please take time to remind yourself of your first love and your commitment to Jesus, who is our truest testimony. Let's pray together. We thank you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus for leading us once again this evening. And as we reflect on the message for this evening, there are just two things we'd like to pray for in a special way. Father, remind us of your relationship with you, of the testimony that we have with you. Sometimes we get drowned into so many different challenges of this world that we forget, Heavenly Father, that we still have a relationship with you, that you are still longing for us to grow in. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that this evening you may indeed cement our relationship with you. Secondly, Father, I'd like to pray that if there be any among us who have not made a commitment for you, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, that we do so now before we share in the participation of the plagues that are filled with your wrath. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as you are wrapping up the matters of this world and as you are punishing wickedness and sin, may you, Father, save as many of us as are willing to obey and to accept your grace, and that, Heavenly Father, through that salvation, we may be spared from the suffering of this world that is impending. This we pray through Christ Jesus. Amen.